And I think one of the benefits of experiencing chronic illness is we have an ability to be more present in our lives than most people are because we are have to be so attuned. We're always so conscious of what we feel like. And I think that most of us are wondering why we feel that way. And so that puts us in a position to be more present in our lives and more self-aware. And so I think that's a benefit. It's not a deficit. And I had to learn to see it that way. And so if I can see it that way, then I can help somebody else see it that way. Welcome to Invisible Not Broken. Today, we're talking about music, cooking, and confident self-advocacy in healthcare. Our host, Monica, is joined by musician, chef, and activist, Dion Bullard, who lives with end-stage renal disease. So, Dion, first I have to like tell you your website, whoever did mm. the art, I'm obsessed. Do you have oh, thank like, a story you. behind the art? Because that was gorgeous. Yeah. So I have a graphics guy that I actually met from Upwork. And he's actually in Pakistan. <laughs> and we work a lot with stuff like that. And so, but the press release, I actually did it. The photos, I kind of like learned how to use Canva because we're a small operation over here. We have to kind of get creative. And so it kind of worked out. I mean, Canva is the ultimate for all of us who want to do big things but don't want to code. Exactly. And now, now Microsoft Designer is coming into play. So I'm really excited about that, too, because I want to learn how to do that. So I'm on that wait list, too, as soon as that launches. You're another techie. A little bit. I don't think I have the attention span. Neither do so I. Really, I just want to love Canva. <laughs> exactly, because it's so easy. You can just... And you can basically teach yourself. And once you play with it a little bit, you, you have it. You have it. I, back before I started doing this, I was a photographer. And I was a photographer right when everything switched from like, we'd have all this equipment and uh -huh. then it switched over to digital. And there's all this argument of like, they're not really photographers because they didn't learn the technical details and we're right. the ones because we know dark rooms and right. I am dark rooms. And right. And, feels like we're having a similar argument now, but I'm mean, taking this back to disability. I feel like a lot of the technology and the new gadgets and the new programs, like the Python language, all of this is easier. And I don't think it's a bad thing. It, it allows creativity without gatekeeping technicalities. Exactly. And without, without all the other limitations that come along with that. I mean, I don't have the attention. I'm tired. I'm on lots of meds. I don't have the attention span to learn. Mm -hmm. I have teenagers that I'm raising. Like, I don't have the space to figure this stuff out. Let's talk about figuring stuff out because you're doing a lot. Working full time. And yep. I just listened to your single. It was beautiful. And Thank I can you. really you. feel your experience uh -huh. coming through your music. Uh -huh. Talk to me about what your life is like. What are you doing and how are you doing all of it? Well, I was first diagnosed with ESRD and stage renal disease in 2005. And I've always been a very active and energetic person and, and developing ESRD that all immediately changed because I was immediately more lethargic and I was tired all the time, you know, after dialysis treatments and stuff like that. And so I just decided one day that I wasn't going to just not do anything, you know? We already know that with a disability, you can, you have the option of getting on social security and doing that sort of thing as your income, but that's extremely limited and it's not enough to do anything with. Okay, <laughs> let's take just a quick moment here because I am on that program and mm -hmm. if I wasn't married, I would be mm -hmm. rude. Absolutely. You that $1,200 would feed myself, my child, rent, and- Exactly, even, exactly. have a doctor's appointment. Like, At all. The other thing I just wanted to cover really quickly when we're talking about disability is mm -hmm. people seem to think, well, you're disabled. You just right. get disability, right? And it's no, right. it's no income for six months. Right. You cannot make any money. A or more, financial. or more in some yeah. cases. Some people have a, a much a longer wait, depending on, you know, how active or inactive the people who are or advocating for them are. <laughs> you know? Exactly. Like my mother yeah. had to help me through this because it was mm -hmm. a full-time job for six months. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure that people understood, like when we're talking about disability, it's not that we don't pride issue going into disability. It is very yeah. hard to get in and you have to be at a certain financial level to even start to try. Absolutely. And then, especially if you're a person who has a newly developed chronic illness, you have to get used to having that illness and so, or, or that disability. It's not a pride thing. It's much more of a I'm so used to be, being able to do it. And then uh, all of a sudden, 
you're hit with this sometimes in most cases out of the blue with not being able to and so you have to you have to navigate that transition as well in your entire life and the people around you have to navigate that transition as well so that can be a little difficult also especially if you're a person who's a, is anywhere near compassionate you go well there's always someone else worse off than me or i can still do it and then you sometimes do more harm to yourself than you intended to because you know, or you overexert yourself in some way, you know, so there's a lot of things to navigate through when you I have mean, a chronic illness. I mean, the overexert thing is huge. Yeah. When, like, mm -hmm. I don't know if you feel this way, but like, I have people in my life and they're always trying to take the stuff I can't do. So the second right. I have any energy, I will throw oh. myself back into a bad loop if I try to clean the house. Yep, that's exactly right. I have come from a very large family and they're all very concerned all the time. And so they're like, are you okay? You know, and sometimes I have these bouts where my blood pressure is low. It's a very unstable most of the time. And they're always concerned about me. You know, sometimes it's a little irritating, but I'm grateful that they're here. That sounds like a good thing. They're concerned all the yeah. time until you experience it. So you got a pretty extreme diagnosis. I've been sick since I was a kid. So it was mm -hmm. just lobster bath until it was untenable. Like, sounds like you had a really active thing going on and then something just came up on the side. What did you need from people when you were diagnosed and dealing with stuff? Well, I needed the space to really educate myself and to learn what my limitations were and, and learn what I was able to do and what worked for me. A large part of what I had to get used to was what the doctors talked about was my diet. That was a huge thing because both sides of my family, I come from a huge family that cooks both sides. And my, my uncle on my dad's side was one of the first African-American chefs at the Marriott in, in the 60s in LA. And my mom's side of the family, they're just are wonderful, wonderful cooks. And so we get together constantly and everything is a production over food, like a few times a month. It's just oh, hey, I got some ribeyes on the grill and I got some, you know. And so getting used to doctors telling me that I can't eat anything green or I can't have certain fruits and, and you know, that sort of thing. And then me having to learn what worked best for me because a lot of times, as you probably know and understand, that a lot of times relative to your specific diagnosis, doctors have a one-size-fits-all approach to your treatment and care, and then you have to navigate the understanding of what works best for you and what doesn't, you know? And so those are the things that stand out the most to me. Have you gotten the experience with either friends or family where they know better than your doctors? And if you just, just had coconut oil, all this would be better. <laughs> right, exactly. Either that or don't eat that. You're not supposed to eat that. Or what are you doing? You know, mm. they, they become a little more on edge than you do, especially after you've had your diagnosis for a while and you've learned to be a, a little better adjusted at it. You know, people still don't really fully grasp or really understand what you understand about you. So they, they have those issues. But yes, absolutely. I find that to be true. I love that you're bringing this up. It's one of the things I struggle the most with my friends and family is the infantilization of sick people. Like I'm in yeah. a wheelchair most of the time. So everyone talks uh -huh. to my husband, which I find hilarious. I'm just going to start like slapping kneecaps pretty soon. And I always have someone who tells me, no, no, don't do that. Don't cut your steak. You're going to hurt your wrist. Don't do uh -huh. that. A mother. I, I run two businesses. I'm right. almost 50 for crying out loud. Like I can, I can choose so, when I cut my steak or not. So what exactly is your chronic illness and ah, what are some of the limitations? I have Ehlers-Danlos. So okay. it's a connective tissue disorder. Anything okay. that's connected can go away. Oh, um, wow. I can dislocate by pointing. I have pots so I can bait by standing. Oh. I have a bunch of other like little things that I just don't even bother looking at because the rest of it's just so annoying. <laughs> right, right, right. I know it's funny because when, when it, it, it's the same thing, it's like, I'm, I've always been so active and outgoing. Mm -hmm. and, and a lot of the time, you know, th we talked about uh, the, the lack of energy. I'm talking about like now I'm noticing I'm having lower back pain issues and it's like a chain reaction. It's like it's so annoying and interesting at the same time, how it's a snowball effect and it's all relative to the original illness. And really, the body is actually amazing and it's scary all at the same time. 
a way to phrase it. Amazing and scary because you're right. One little thing changes and it sets off this weird chain reaction. Like, so I have POTS, which is a heart condition, but it's also a neurological condition. If I don't exercise, my heart muscle gets too weak to function. If I exercise, I will dislocate something. Uh, yeah. If I don't exercise, my muscles aren't strong enough to hold the bone in place. If right. I exercise, I dislocate. Like it's, it's no, exactly. And, and I'm the same way. I'm the sa- same way. But if I don't exercise, I won't have energy. But when I exercise, I don't have energy. And, you know, because I don't have enough energy usually to exercise. So I have to try to find a very, it's a very delicate ballet of doing just enough to keep going and to have some, you know, energy, but without depleting the energy that I'm using to work out. Feel and, that. Yeah, Completely it, in my bones. Yes. I, it, literally in your bones, right? Exactly. <laughs> Thank you for catching that. I had to put a bad mom joke in there somewhere. It's just, it's I required. Know. But 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 that's part of it also, right? Having like looking at it as as not as this debilitating doomsday diagnosis in a way, you know what I mean? You have to find the humor in it and the joy in it and the nuance in it that keeps you going and that makes you want to keep living every day, right? Because it's so easy to fall into the trap of woe is me, you know what I mean? And I think that as long as you keep that that joyous spirit that your your body will react and you'll be okay. You know, you, you're not 100%, but you'll be okay, you know? Real talk. And if you are like, this is not okay, I'm not comfortable with this, too emotional, we can just move right along. But oh, no, I just came out of like a ridiculous what was me depression, like mm-hmm. your first interview in two months because could mm. not even begin to start. So how do you pull yourself through? Like, don't know how you do things. Right, right. But I know I can sound really positive until suddenly I am not okay. It takes time for you to pull it out. Yes. And you know what? That's okay too. Because understanding yourself and understanding that you are a human being and everything is not always going to be smiles and rainbows and sunshine and moonlight. You know what I mean? It's not always going to be that. But you still have the good moments to look forward to. And I think that for me, that's what does it. Like, it's like mm-hmm. sometimes, sometimes you just can't, you don't have anything to be happy about. Yeah. You know? But also for me, it's like, it was a pointed, intentional deciding that I'm not going to let it literally kill me. You know what I mean? Like it wants to, your body wants to kill you, <laughs> you know, you know, but it's like, damn it, I'm not going to let you kill me. You know what I mean? And so you have to fight on. And like I said, I don't know you, but you, you have a family. So that's probably some of your motivation as well. You know what I mean? Like, I don't have any kids, but I do. I'm very close to my family. And so I want to be around for them. And so for me, like knowing that as long as I'm on the right side of the dirt, there's another reason to be okay today. Even if I just want to stay in bed all day. And if I want to stay in bed all day, eat potato chips, that's what I'll do today. Or watch every episode of Succession again for the 90th time. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh my God. This last week. Wow. I just, I can't even. Yes. It's like I have a friend and we have, I work with a nonprofit called Create Now, and they take arts programs into places where people wouldn't get them. So, women's shelters, homeless shelters for kids, at risk youth, women's shelters, you know, all, all sorts of places. And I met Laura and we have bonded over succession. We text each other like in real time while we're watching the episode. I am so jealous. No one in my life is watching that show. And I have so Oh my God, you have a new succession friend. We have to text each other when succession comes on. You're involved in activism. I Mm -hmm. try as hard as I can be to be involved in activism. I'm very passionate. And I feel like this show actually gives us a look at the people in powers. I think it almost becomes like, you know, the president is lionized or the congressperson is in power. We can't even begin to scale this power. And And we can't see them as human. We disassociate them with being people who have feelings and emotions and lives and disabilities just like we do. And understanding that about those characters, it's a very good positive distraction, a very good healthy distraction. If I understand correctly, you have an amazing music career. Your music is gorgeous. I cannot wait thank for you, thank to you. be released. You are involved in catering. Is that what I understand? Right. So I have a culinary degree. I went to Le Cordon Bleu. 
So I'm, I'm a private chef and I have a catering business. So I do that outside of my day job, which is something related to food. So I'm a food service director at a long-term healthcare facility. So I'm around people all day who need help and advocacy around their food. And so I do that. So prior to going to culinary school, many years ago, I was in a singing group, an R&B singing group called Straight Up when I was about 16, 17-ish. And we did a lot of stuff. We were, you know, on the rise and we had a, we had just got a record deal and then the group broke up. And then I kind of got jaded with the whole idea of the entertainment business and all of that sort of thing. And I ended up right back there because before I went to culinary school, I, one of my best friends is a music supervisor in film and TV. She wanted me to, originally she wanted me to help her find an assistant. And then I said, okay. So by the end of the conversation, she said, well, why don't you just be my assistant? And so I, so I was like, okay, whatever. So I ended up doing that with her. And then she decided to go move away. And instead of me continuing to be a music supervisor, I went to culinary school. Music assistant to culinary school. Not and, just a regular culinary school. Like if anyone that's listening has not gone into this world, this is incredibly uh -huh. physical. Like Exactly. I went to culinary school a year after my diagnosis and a year after beginning dialysis treatment. Okay, I, because, need, I need so much more information here because mm -hmm. like, you might as well have told me you just were like, I got diagnosed with this and I went to go climb Everest. School is no joke. It, it's like One brutal. class is five hours a day. It's all very physical because you're learning knife skills and you're moving pots and you're washing dishes and you're doing all that stuff. And so I would get up at five in the morning, go to culinary school because class started at six and I would be done by noon. And then I would go to dialysis at two o'clock. And, and that's kind of still how I do work. Okay. I've been doing that for the last 18 years. In, in January, it'll be 19 years that I have been experiencing ESRD. But I, it, it just came from a place of I immediately was able to get myself to a place of I can do nothing and just wither away emotionally and probably physically as well. Or I can just try to be as active for as long as much as I can, as long as I can. I think I kind of flipped that switch without really, really fully understanding that that's what I was doing. It was just a thing of me needing more than just being at home. You know what I mean? And, and some people need to just be at home. But for me, I just, I needed to be out. I needed to be as active as possible because I, I didn't want to leave anything undone. You know, I wanted to feel like I was doing as much as I could as frequently as I could. And I know by no means do I want to sound like a superhuman and, and I don't want anybody to get that impression because trust me, there are days where I do n nothing for days. You know what I mean? But when I'm at work, the energy that I get is from knowing that I'm helping somebody else through whatever they're experiencing at the moment. And so back, but briefly back to the music. And so that was part of the reason that I decided to go back into recording because that very same idea of not wanting to leave anything undone. I knew that that was something that brought me joy before, and that's what my life is about now. And so I want to start to enjoy the things and do the things that bring me joy and that I'm passionate about. And music was one of those things. And so the reason that I chose that song was because originally when that song was written, that song was written for a person, Shirley Horn, who was going toward the end of her career. She had a long, illustrious career, was wonderful. And the song was kind of like a toast to her, her career, to her past. And I heard it from a totally different perspective. I heard it from a place of looking forward to what's coming. And so if I could do that for somebody that heard that song and heard my story attached to it, hopefully I could motivate somebody else to try just a little harder or to advocate for themselves in a way that they didn't really understand or really know how or even really know that they could do. Or it empowers somebody else to find the strength to keep going and to create some goals for themselves and, you know, that sort of thing. So I just wanted to be more motivational and more encouraging and inspiring to somebody else. And I felt like I could attach my story to that music and do that for somebody else through that music. And that's one of the things that I find really interesting. And someday I'd love to see a study done on those of us who have been sick, so many of us are creative. Like, I don't know how most of you process, like everyone I've talked to who suddenly got sick, I don't know how you guys do it. I, I mm -hmm. now know. That's insane. But there doesn't seem to be any other way to process these big things. Yeah. 
you can either let it consume you to the point of no return, or you can do what we do and what you do through your podcast, which is use it as a tool to help someone else. And by helping someone else, it also, it, it provides a sort of therapy for yourself as well. Because singing that song, singing that music and, and, and recording that music is like therapy for me, mm. but the end product is going to be useful, a useful tool for someone else, which is why I wanted to do this podcast when, I, when the opportunity presented itself, because I think it's absolutely amazing that you do this every day and somebody can always go back to it. You know, somebody might hear something today that sparks something in them that they need two weeks from now or a year from now and go back and refer to it. So the work you do is commendable as well. It shouldn't, it's not, it's, it's nothing to shake a stick at. <laughs> Thank you. There's no, no stick shaking at anything. In the <laughs> if anyone who gets their tail up and does something, I'm, I'm highly yeah. impressed. And yeah. the reason we do this podcast is when people get diagnoses, I don't feel like doctors understand how to talk to us. It's no. really upsetting. I remember the first time a doctor told me I wasn't going to walk and it was supposed mm. to be this huge tragedy moment. I mean, I had been right. a, I was a ballerina and mm -hmm. he was like, you're going to be in a wheelchair. And it was like, you could almost hear the violin start, like, like, right, right, and right, going right, to like right. come in and start crying over my poor legs. And my dad started crying. Wheelchairs don't sound too bad. I, I can roll over people's toes. The way the news was given to me was so like, we're going to give you a minute. And it's like, mm -hmm. why are you assuming this is how I feel? And there's been diagnoses with like that same sort of like vibe. Mm -hmm. And if, if we can do this podcast where I can talk to somebody who's going through something, the good, the bad, the ugly, this is what's like living with this. Right. Don't, don't understand what living with this is. Absolutely. And that's, and that's what I meant earlier when I said they have this blanket approach to the dissemination of that information and to care. Everything doesn't work for everyone and everything doesn't always apply. Yeah, we may have the same condition, yes, but everybody responds to those conditions in different ways. And where you are mentally and emotionally will, will greatly affect how you respond to it. And so for me, I was feeling sick for a few days and it got worse and worse. And I didn't realize how much weight I had lost. And thank God for my mom. I was laying around her house when I never, I didn't feel well, I was we'd go to my mom's house. And, and so she's like, she opened the door to the room. She said, are you okay? And I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know? And she said, well, it's, it's one o'clock and you are laying down still and you're never, you, you never lay around this late. She said, okay, fine. So she closes the door. She comes back about 30 minutes later. And she says, if you're fine, get up and walk over here. I don't know what sparked her, made her, you know, just mom's intuition, right? And so me wanting to get her to get off my case, I jump up to go take a two steps and I fall down. And she's like, you have to go to the hospital. And I went to the hospital and that day had to be getting emergency dialysis. And that was 18 years ago. And I've been on dialysis three times a week, now four and a half hours a day for 18 years. And but, you're on the transplant list, which is a lifestyle in and of itself. Absolutely. And I actually just entered the list in October because I was, you know, one of those people who felt like I'm okay. And I, I thought that I knew everything about this illness and disease. And I thought I saw that people, some people had more issues after they got the transplant. And, and I was like, well, I, I'm fine now. You know what I mean? Everything is okay. And then as time progressed, I started to go, I don't want to push my luck. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> and so I kind of want to stick around a little bit. So let me do what it takes because, you know, the life expectancy on someone who is on dialysis without a kidney transplant is seven years. Well, I lived almost double that, you know, with no transplant, thank God, you know, just me understanding that educating myself a little bit more about what it takes and what's needed and what's necessary has made me look at it a lot more di differently. I'm not, I don't see it as a death sentence. I do have my dark days, but I've learned to, to, to get back to your point about doctors not knowing what to say to you and not how to deal with you to speak to you as a person who's experiencing the issue is that I've learned 
the importance of advocating for myself and asking questions and really paying attention to what my body is saying and what I'm feeling and what I'm experiencing so that I can articulate that in a way that makes them understand. Prime example, I was in the hospital. I was experiencing septic shock. And I was shivering because I was so cold and I started developing this tightness in my chest. And so everybody kept telling me, including doctors, kept saying, well, you were, you're clenching your body. And so maybe your muscles are just, you know, tense. And I said, that sounded reasonable, but me being me, the, I think the way I think I'm going, but you don't know that. And so I was really adamant about them giving me an ultrasound in, in the muscle. Come to find out, I had a blood clot in my chest and that's what the pain was. And until I said, give me an ultrasound to figure it out, if they hadn't done that, that could have been terminal. <laughs> So, and I, I brought that point up to stress being able to advocate for yourself and knowing you know what you feel. And so being able to articulate that, I think is something that will help anyone across any level of chronic illness, being able to advocate for yourself when you can, but there are some people who can't, right? That's something that I'm really, I'm really, really, really leaning heavily toward is finding a way that I can be, be an advocate for people who are experiencing end-stage renal disease and are, are experiencing dialysis treatments at dialysis centers, because let's, let me not even get on the subject of the disparities in care and the inconsistencies in cares from one center to another under the same banner of the same company, you know? So that's a whole nother show. What happens is every center does not have enough staff. But part of the reason that they're, they're having trouble with staffing the, the centers is, do you realize that those people actually work in healthcare and do not have healthcare? They work there and they can't even afford the healthcare. So the CEOs and the, and the presidents uh, and the higher ups in those companies, they make billions of dollars a year and they get bonuses that are crazy, even the administrators in those places, but they won't even give the people who actually have to treat people who need the healthcare the most healthcare. And I'm going, how is this happening? And like technicians are telling me that they can't even afford to buy healthcare for themselves. The inequity in care that you receive at one place based on where it is in the city compared to other places in the city are really unfair and unjust and unequal as well. And I know that because I went to a clinic that was in Inglewood, California when I started it's open 24 hours. So you can go anytime. First of all, there are only two clinics like that in the greater Los Angeles area. One is in Downey, which is about 25 miles away from the other clinic, right? So you either have to go all the way to Downey if you live in the middle, or you have to go all the way to Beverly and Crescent Heights near that area if you need to work and go to dialysis, right? The level of care that I receive now where I am, just the perks. The technicians bring you tea and coffee to your chair and graham crackers if you need it. None of that happened in Eaglewood. And it's the same company. And so there are disparities in care and inequities in care that I think that are unfair because I feel like if you are one company under one banner, the level of treatment and care you should receive should be consistent and standard at every location. That's a part of that advocacy work that I want to do because it's like, I want to go maybe go into these places and say, hey, I noticed that this is different there. Down to the band-aids that they use and the materials that they use. I'm like, how is this okay? And so I just feel like I, I, I'm in a place that I really want to be able to help people who can't, who don't know any better. And I think we all know what the difference is between mm -hmm. why Beverly Center had a safer and more comfortable experience than Inglewood. Exactly, that exactly. So many words yes, that I will yes. not be using. Absolutely. One of the that I wanted to fight for is what we're talking about, which is this idea of, of we need a maximum wage. And we used to have one in the United yep. States. And that went yep. away in the 80s. I am so old. But we did have a <laughs> maximum wage. And it literally only applied to one person yeah. at the time. Like, so we need to kind of look at getting back to that. And when we're talking about these health companies mm -hmm. and these billions of dollars that these CEOs make, 
It would be yes. amazing if we could push for a common good where you're talking about Inglewood and I used to live down in that area. There's no uh -huh. bus that works. Like there's mm -hmm. no public transportation. So for people to get three times a week, if they don't have a car, why can't they team up with Lyft or Uber to give subsidized free rides to people to get to and from? Well, I know that there are some programs that actually do that now. So along with some of the Medicare, Medicare packages actually do have that, that, that benefit because I know my aunt has as she's developing a chronic illness and a part of her insurance plan, she can use Lyft. I need better all, insurance. Or you have to get worse off physically to get the more care. Like, for example, with me, because my illness is in stage renal disease, which means that they expect you to die. Death is literally in the title of the disease, you know, in stage. And so because of that fact, I have all of the care. I get everything. You know what I mean? And so that means I qualify for access, which is the access rides, which is specifically for people with medical issues, people who have medical assisted devices. It's a transportation system that will take you anywhere you need to go. It'll take you to medical appointments. It'll take you to the grocery store if you need to go to the grocery store. But once again, that's not something that's widely promoted. And people, a lot of people don't even know that that's available in them. Also, once you get approved for access, you get the membership card, you can actually ride public transportation for free and have one person ride with you. But once again, who's telling people that? Who's telling people about that stuff? Nobody's telling people about that stuff. I want to help provide support for people in, in all those ways, in any way that I possibly can. And that's advocating for them, whether it's going into their dialysis center, talking to their nurses about, you know, what they're experiencing or, and that they're unable to articulate, or even showing up when they have to go into the hospital for something, you know? I want them to be able to call me and say, hey, can you come help me talk to my doctor? Or, hey, what resources or sources are available for trans? transportation. You know, I need help with this. I want to be able to be like a 360 support system and a level of advocacy care for someone or people. So you talked to quite a few times about advocating for yourself. Mm -hmm. And as someone who absolutely bites at this ability, I have almost no ability to advocate for myself. And how do you get doctors to listen to you? Is there a special way to phrase things? Is there a special way to talk to them where they can let their egos go and go, oh, I'm going to listen to this person now. I try to speak as plainly as I possibly can and as clearly as I possibly can. You know, I try to use the words that I've heard them use. Mm. And I try to I try to explain it in a way that I think that any human, normal, human, compassionate human can understand. But we all know that doctors are trained to be non-compassionate. <laughs> <Un -compassionate. laughs> I don't mean like unfeeling or uncaring, but kind of blank. They, okay. they can't be overly emotional. That, yeah. I think that's part of their curriculum is like to be unemotional about, you know, and, and not really feeling about what you feel. And I think that's probably what the disconnect is also. Mm -hmm. If they just put themselves in your position for a moment. So this is one point I would say, one tip that I would say. When a doctor says it's probably just this, the first thing you should say to the doctor is, it was, how do you know? Oh my how God, How do yes. you know? How do you know? How do you know that it's probably just this? You didn't do any testing. You didn't do any troubleshooting. How do you know? That's the first question I would say. That phrase, that one phrase would be your biggest help. <laughs> your biggest asset is, how do you know, doctor? Brilliant. And if they can't, if they can't successfully articulate for you, for your understanding, how they know, then keep pushing, mm -mm. you know? And, and I think that's probably the, the singular most important thing I could, I could offer is say, how do you know, and keep pushing. They may feel like you're being, you know, a pain, but in the long run, they'll appreciate it. You know, I've had doctors say, oh, wow, I'm glad you said that or I'm glad you kept pushing. They'll get a little irritated at first, but you'll be better for it because you'll get the treatment or the care that you need relative to that issue that you're experiencing. That so, and your idea of mirroring their language is, mm -hmm. they do feel like we speak two different languages. We're in pain, we're scared, we're speaking emotionally. A lot of doctors actually do try to speak in layman's terms, but most of them are so on autopilot 
that they're speaking from, like you said, textbook. And so learning to understand what they're saying when they say one thing or what they mean when they say something else and really probing to find out, to get clarity, you know, to ask, okay, well, what does that mean? Or how is that going to affect me? Or, well, what is that medication for? Or you're saying that I'm going to have to do this. Okay, why do I have to do that? And, and how is that going to affect how I feel right now, <laughs> you know? I really am looking forward to your advocacy work because I have yeah. a feeling it's going to help a lot of people, not just your community. I think this is has far reaching. Absolutely. I, and because I, I think that no matter who you are, or what you have or what you look like, I think when we're all reduced to pain and fear and anxiety around our health, we look the same and we feel the same. And I think that we all deserve to be our best selves. And we all know that, you know, experiencing chronic illness, you're not, sometimes you're not always able to be your best self. And I think that if I can be a person who helps provide just a little bit of assurance and a little bit of comfortability, or is that a word? Is it is now. I, I am here for like, if you know, Shakespeare can do it, we can too. God damn it. And I'm like, wait a minute. It's yeah, yeah, yeah. If I can be someone's bright spot in any way, I think to me, it's worth all of it. It's amazing how we can distill down our purpose in life. Like, mm -hmm. especially when there's a limitation on it, either timeline or physical abilities. Yeah. It's it's amazing how you've distilled down your art, your purpose, your work, everything down to what you want to say with your life. Yeah. And I think that that takes some self-awareness. Mm -hmm. And and you have to be, and I think that's another another benefit. And I think one of the benefits of experiencing chronic illness is we have an ability to be more present in our lives than most people are because we are have to be so attuned. We're always so conscious of what we feel like. And I think that most of us are wondering why we feel that way. And so that puts us in a position to be more present in our lives and more self-aware. And so I think that's a benefit. It's not a deficit. And I had to learn to see it that way. And so if I can see it that way, then I can help somebody else see it that way. That's beautiful. I don't know what show I was watching, but there's some line in it that was, don't see it as being done to you, see it as being done for you. And that's exactly what that is. But you got to get there. And nobody is on a specific timeline and you don't have to get there today. But everybody hopefully gets there at some point in their own time, in their own space. And, and that's, again, that's that grace, right? That grace we were talking about earlier is like giving people the grace to get where they need to get to when they get there and understanding that their time frame is not our time frame. And after raising young adults, I will say that unless you can give yourself the grace first, you have no chance in giving other people grace. Like I heard someone say, you know, in the Bible it says, my cup runneth over. What? What's in the cup is for you. And what runs over is for everyone else. And unless your wow. cup is already full, you ain't got nothing to give. That's, <laughs> That's a beautiful statement. Um, I'm going to have to ruminate on that. <laughs> and so they don't kidnap you for the rest of the day. I want to talk to you a little bit about what tools you are using because you are doing an insane amount of work in varied mm -hmm. sectors. What kind of tools do you have apps that you use? If I looked at my phone right now, it's probably like a billion apps in my phone for everything from, from money management to saving. As far as health and wellness, I use, it's called Silver Sneakers. It's all a part of the Medi-Cal Medicare insurance. Oh. If you have like if you have Blue Cross or Blue Shield, I think one of them, they give it to you as well because it gives you free healthcare membership at any gym in your area. And it's like a thousand gyms, like different ones from 24-hour fitness to Blink Fitness to Planet Fitness. Like you can go to any one of those through your Silver Sneakers app. But the best part about it, it's on-demand workout videos in the app. And so if you don't feel like going outside today, but you want to just kind of do something to keep your body moving, you can, you know, go into your phone and do some stuff from there. So that's one that I'm starting to use a little bit more. But, you know, I'm a social media geek. So Instagram and Facebook and all of those you know, social media apps are the things that I'm like on way too much. I try to so, convince myself it's education because I have right. my, my work Instagram is Invisible Not Broken. And I also am an artist. I paint and draw all the time. And so I have my happy Instagram, which is all uh -huh. like learning yeah. how to draw better. There's a reason right. for it. It's like I'm, like I'm laughing because I'm like, I'm using screen time to learn how to reduce <laughs> my screen time. Like how silly is that? 
like a very now problem. Yeah, yeah. My last yeah. question for you as a chef, mm -hmm. is there anything in your kitchen that helps you feed yourself on those days where you're like, I can't, I, I cannot get up and take care of myself. And yes, I absolutely will take, I have Uber Eats, that's fine. Yeah. So I have, it's called the Ninja Foodie Grill and it's the seven in one. Yeah. Yeah. And, it, and it's a square thing that sits on your countertop and it has a basket that goes inside it for roasting and air frying and dehydrating, but it also has like a porcelain plate that sits inside it. When you take the basket out, when you put it on the grill mode, it will give grill marks on a steak or something. So on the days when I come from dialysis, I try to cook things that I can eat for a couple of days because I'm usually too quick, too tired, or too, you know, lethargic to cook a full meal. But, but I can heat something up really quickly. But if I do have some more energy on a particular day and I'm like, oh, I feel like cooking today, I try to use my Instapot or the Ninja Foodie Grill because I can grill a steak in my Ninja Foodie Grill in like seven to 12 minutes. If I can cook a pot of chili in the Instapot in 35 minutes, like it literally is amazing. Like it's my favorite gadget. My two favorite, most favorite things in the kitchen are my Ninja Foodie Grill and my Instapot. Okay, but can I ruin your life real quick before we go? Uh -huh. The Ninja Mixer can do chicken tikka masala in 10 minutes. Oh, Jesus 30 Christ. Minutes, 30 minutes in your little, like, in your mixer. I feel like Ninja is going to, like, take over my life. Seriously. Yeah. Dion, I adore talking to you. I, I do. I, I do. You I do. Soon. So much fun. So easy to talk to. And I really appreciate you having me on. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, thank you for coming. Thank you everyone for sticking with us. I know we've been doing a lot of reruns. Thank you for dealing with my long-term depression, everyone. So I'm back. We're doing new few episodes soon. So thank you so much. We're also starting a new section on technology and disability. So hit me up and let me know what gadgets you want me to test out or what kinds of things you want me to look into. That'd be great. And um, hey, be kind, be gentle, be a badass. It's certainly the time for it. That's right. Thank you for joining us today. To find out more about today's episode, including show notes, transcripts, and more, please visit InvisibleNotBroken.com. Please rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. You can also support this show by heading over to our Patreon or by sharing these episodes. We are not advertising, and our growth is thanks to you listeners. Thank you to our host, Monica and Dion, for a great conversation. This episode was edited by me, Luke Spine. Last but not least, be kind, be gentle, and be badass.